Wasa region. Um, uh, but you're all heroes and idols, um, except here. Um, so what I am going to talk about, uh, to give a little bit different, the topic of my... Sorry, were you finding a meter just now? <laughs> trying to fix your presentation here. <laughs> it's broken. Broken? What do you mean? Okay. Oh. <clears throat> well, okay. Um, so you have to get something a little bit different. Uh, the topic of my talk is flying monkeys. And uh, maybe just to uh, allow you to understand that a little bit and get it around your tongue. When I say the next time flying monkeys, can you respond with flying monkeys? <laughs> flying monkeys. Flying monkeys. <clears throat> okay, so most of you are saying that. So most of you are uh, starting to get a feeling what uh, flying monkeys is about. Okay, the PDF will be fine. Yes. You get to see two slides at a time. <coughs> and no animations, but that's not a problem. Um, so, uh, as Kit has mentioned, um, I'll go back a little bit further because a lot of people don't know much about me, and um, we thought it was probably best to keep it that way. But I'll say a little bit um, out of uh, my teen years interest in human evolution and then into primate evolution, and from there, uh, interest in great ape conservation, and eventually into sporting orangutan organizations in Indonesia, and eventually coming out to Indonesia in 2006, volunteering in Kalimantan, um, in the jungles of Borneo, hearing that dawn chorus of the gibbons, and I fell in love with gibbons. So I was looking for an opportunity to work with rehabilitation of gibbons, and uh, ended up in this rescue center down the road from here in 2006. Um, and what actually made me stay was learning about uh, bears, being involved in bear rescue and captive welfare for bears. That made me stay in Thailand. And three years I was here, um, but learning about rehabilitation of gibbons, um, we were learning by doing, learning by bringing experts in, learning with collaboration with universities and, and so on, for getting givens out for release and stuff. But also um, the other primates and other animals, and particularly the macaques. So working with five species of macaques in Thailand, and wrapping my head around understanding how to rehabilitate macaques, socialize macaques, getting macaques to, that have come from different individual traumatic uh, experiences and they're living together. Um, at the end of 2009, the second half of 2009, Edwin had enough of me, sent me to Indonesia to help an ailing centre out there <coughs> as a leading WFFT effort to, to support that centre. Um, and so I was able to translate knowledge of working with time camps to working with Sulawesi camps. Uh, the centre in Sulawesi was in a wildlife trafficking hotspot with wildlife from all over Indonesia coming in, and particularly a lot of uh, lorries, parrots, and cockatoos. And so that was really then the uh, a bridging moment of having had basically a lot of experience focused on primate rehabilitation to then wrap your head around uh, captive care for parrots and the cockatoos, which I call flying monkeys. So you understand a little bit about that. And then from um, Sulawesi, looking for opportunities to prevent further parrots coming in, and also opportunities for all the rescue centers in the west of Indonesia that were filling up with parrots to have other places. I branched out eastward in Indonesia, and 2018 to 19, just before the pandemic, I spent a year, more than a year, 
and one of the national parks there helping to set them, uh, helping them to set up a new parrot rescue rehabilitation and rescue uh, release operation there, uh, for which the proposals I did for them help them to get a million dollars in to build up the center, which was inaugurated at the end of last year. Um, so, flying monkeys. So why am I saying flying monkeys? Um, we're talking about highly intelligent species. Um, but, but not only that, not only the, the cognition, um, they are <coughs> very agile uh, and adapt. Uh, cockatoos can stand on one foot and then manipulate things with the other foot, like an opposable thumb hand, like a primate. Um, and um, their wild activity budget is similar in terms of the fact that they are diurnal foragers. Uh, similar kind of diets and um, so similar kind of landscapes that they've evolved in and um, yes they are adaptable adaptable to human conditions uh, urban environments um, being taken in as pets and so on and uh, like monkeys cockatoos also have the ability to bite the face off so um, there are a lot of parallels there, and um, I get to see four slides at once, just to make things quicker. Um, there were some videos in there, but never mind. Um, so you start to get the picture of why I'm talking about flying monkeys. Um, <clears throat> from an evolutionary perspective, you know, I see this uh, parallel of the Sunda side, totally separated from Sahul by geography, uh, and all of the, you know, on this side, what most of you guys are working with Sunda wildlife, with the um, primates and ungulates and big cats and stuff, and of course the bears. Um, on the other side, none of that, but a lot of different species like marsupials and monotremes and uh, ratites and birds of paradise and uh, Lores paris and cockatoos. <coughs> and so you have. Also, then, in between these two areas, what I call the heart of Indonesia, and certainly the heart of the work that I've been involved in the past five years, um, the Wallasea region, which is a unique crossover zone between these two uh, distinct uh, sets of biogeography. Um, so the, the cockatoos have potentially uh, evolved in uh, similar landscapes or similar ecological niches and um, so they're flying monkeys. Um, a little bit, um, this is about the bird life of Indonesia, um, uh, with the large country spanning the three ecoregions, uh, a lot of species there, a number of endemic species, and a lot of endangered species. So you obviously know there are big issues with uh, well, bird trade, uh, particularly in Indonesia. And, um, Eight species of cockatoos now, with the orange crested cockatoo being elevated to its own species. And of those eight species, uh, five are endemic to Indonesia, not found anywhere else, and another three are also in Papua New Guinea or into Australia. And so the ones that have population outside of Indonesia are least concerned, but those inside Indonesia are heading towards extinction, critically endangered, endangered. Uh, vulnerable, though, last uh, assessment of the Molucan cockatoos, the sun crested cockatoos, was almost 10 years ago. So, by now, um, with this ongoing ramp trade, this is a, on this resolution, difficult to see the, the map, but it's a mapping I've done collecting lots of data together of different trade routes and uh, stuff to look at how to prioritize efforts on dealing with the trafficking. And you see examples of um, birds stuffed into different containers. Um, there can be just individual birds uh, occasionally, but usually uh, a handful, a dozen, a couple of dozen, sometimes 70, 80 birds in one go, uh, with 
some of the smaller barrows like lorries and stuff, it can be hundreds in one go, and then you have like on the other side with songbirds, as people may know, you get thousands in one confiscation. And with essentially hardly any facilities in these regions to deal with these, this has been one of the major challenges in how to deal with wildlife confiscated from this trade, since all parrots are now, for the past four years, on the protected species list. So, birds from those conditions uh, coming in. So, what we've seen in, in areas closer to the, the source of the birds is that around 80% or so of the confiscation would be relatively freshly poached from the forest birds and less than 20% would be the ones that have already been kept as pets or something like that for a longer time. Um, as you move further away towards the uh, west of Indonesia, that ratio uh, starts to switch over um, in terms of the confiscations. But the difference in, in dealing with those is quite significant because with the uh, newly poached birds, they're more acute uh, conditions of trauma in them, um, whereas with the pet birds, they're more chronic issues, especially behavioral um, issues related to improper diet cascade and so on and so forth. So a variety of different approaches and methods that need to be taken depending on where the birds have come from. And this it, it parallels with work that you would may do with primates, or with bears, or with uh, uh, some of the other species. So I'm generalizing here, and trying to show you the parallels. Um, but with you know, these white cockatoos, for example, the umbrella cockatoos, they are endangered, endemic only to um, North Moluccas, Halmahera, and a few surrounding islands there. And uh, getting many confiscations in at a time, how to, how to preserve or maximize the conservation value of those confiscations. So this has been part of the driving force to work with a variety of government agencies um, that are having to deal with this and help them find solutions to tackle this. Because otherwise, with no um, proper support, no guidance, no budgets and so on, they have no choices but to either let the birds sit in cages like this on the office floor or dump them in the forest with absolutely no appraisal whatsoever. Um, so between those two extremes, trying to find a happy medium and develop resources then for uh, proper rehabilitation. And so, yeah, now in 2023, we have um, Indonesia's first dedicated parrot rehabilitation center, the, called the Parrot Sanctuary in Halmahera, and the um, provinces of North Molucca and Moluccas, their wildlife management agency also managed to get a large budget to set up uh, proper transit centers in all of their main offices in nine locations across the two provinces, um, with also a, a mega budget involved in there. So now the capacity is building up to properly take care of these and we've gone through a variety of bits and pieces of making sure that they are prepared um, as more and more uh, confiscations take place. Um, <clears throat> so for maximizing conservation value, um, teaching them the importance of a variety of aspects of dealing with uh, triage of all these birds that have come in sorting out the ones that need critical care and applying critical care and stuff like that, trying to ensure that um, we mitigate any possibilities of diseases coming in, proper quarantine and all of these kind of issues, um, disease screening and stuff like that, proper appraisal of the birds. I mean, in some cases where birds have been confiscated, the poachers have mutilated in some way the flight feathers for these birds that they can't fly, in some, some cases just yanking out all the flight feathers, which causes a mutilation which takes a long time to recover from. And um, so there have been cases where the government have tried to release birds that just couldn't fly because they didn't actually check whether they had flight feathers or not. So a variety of uh, protocols, SOPs, 
set up uh, training keepers, training vets in how to properly assess and care for these birds. Um, and again, coming from the experience with working on primate rehabilitation, uh, because you're often under pressure to make space and get individual rescues through the system into a group or ready for release. Um, and the importance then of understanding how to properly profile different personalities of the individuals so that you can match make or build groups effectively uh, without too many issues because as I said before these are um, species that can bite your face off. <clears throat> um, so back to what I said about the activity budget this chart is a generalization that I used uh, previously to talk about the similarity between um, developing original programs for bears and orangutans, um, but also applying to macaques and again to the cockatoos. The fact that the wild activity budget has almost half of their time spent on searching for, foraging for, processing their food. Um, that if that time is condensed in captivity to a silver tray served twice a day with freshly cut up and peeled fruit or whatever, um, with absolutely no work to do to get it, then that impacts a lot on the uh, disparity of the captive activity budget and the wild activity budget. So strategies in the temporal distribution of food, the spatial distribution of food, and uh, making food challenging uh, to stimulate natural behaviour for foraging are all important things in here. <clears throat> um, the uh, government agencies have been uh, releasing lots of birds and they're getting better at doing it in, in a bit more organised way. Um, but it's only been possible with, as Nancy was saying earlier, having that trust built and um, open to collaboration and been able to work with now about, in terms of parrots, about 14 uh, different government sites with a variety of things, helping them with uh, assessing their needs, developing proposals, concepts, designs, helping them find funding for it, whether that's through national budgets, CSR projects, and sometimes international funding, which is more challenging because foreign donors are uh, not always uh, trusting to, to put money into the Indonesian government that should be able to afford to do things themselves. Um, training of vets and keepers, helping to recruit um, vets for them, and um, even in some cases, in some of the more remote regions, donating PP and even soap to these poor staff that were left there without resources, having to deal with wildlife coming in and not even having any basic PP, not even soap to wash their hands at work. So um, things like this, um, and including up to long-term residency. As I mentioned before, it was one year in Halmahera from 2018 to 2019, uh, working at Aketa Diarol Lobata National Park and setting up their parrot sanctuary. The uh, middle of the pandemic until the beginning of last year, I was at the South Sulawesi uh, Government Wildlife Authorities helping with a variety of issues there from also because it's a traffic hotspot for parrots and other species. Um, and some other projects which unfortunately haven't got off the ground yet uh, due to lack of uh, land and funding issues but um, the cooperation and collaboration is, is just so important for the whole of the bigger picture of things and having more facilities, whether it's government facilities or even supporting uh, other groups to set up NGOs which I've been doing to become part of this puzzle of um, 
uh, helping to solve the issues around the illegal wildlife trade and trafficking of the species of that region. Um, it's, it's, no one can do everything themselves, so the collaboration is key. And um, with that, I'd just like to remind them, we've got here um, uh, an example of Sulawesi species, the Macaca Nigra, the critically endangered monkey, uh, collaborating with uh, endangered dwarf buffalo, the Nawa, um, to browse above the uh, electric fence there. Um, so I, I tell people that even the animals know how to collaborate for a common goal, so we should be able to as well. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Simon. Um, we have no time for questions, so we have to take it offline. Uh, we can ask uh, questions to Simon whenever uh, during lunch, I suppose. <coughs> Flying monkeys, just remember that. Flying monkeys. If you see people with uh, cockatoos, you say flying monkeys, and they'll have to ask you what you mean, and you can explain it now. Okay, thank you very much, Simon. So the next speaker uh, that's coming up is from Singapore, <coughs> and his name is uh, Adi Kurniawan from the is, uh, Animal Care Giver, okay, um, from the Mandai Wildlife uh, Group. Uh, basically, we used to call ourselves uh, zoo animal keepers. Animal care officers. No, no. Animal care officers. We are getting more PC nowadays. <laughs> so, um, so he, his special interest is in the Sundas pangolin, yeah, and uh, he's um, promoting and driving the conservation of that species. And he's also the co-chair for the. Uh, Southeast Asian branch of the IUCN SSC uh, is the co chair of the Pangolin Specialist Group. So, Ali, you've got the floor. The time starts now. Thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks Peter. So, hi all. Uh,